Hello. Uh, I'd like to go to budget paper four, volume three, page 165. There's a highlight uh, that identifies the department facilitated the government's commitment to evaluating the feasibility of creating a new university for the future and so on. Uh, and I have a series of questions relating to that highlight, if that's of assistance to the chair. I thought you might. Thank you. Um, can I ask, has the minister read the business case that was prepared by the universities? Sorry, has the minister read has the Has the minister read the business case that I understand the universities prepared in relation to informing their decision to proceed with the merger? So uh, there are a number of uh, items of documentation that I think could um, be referred to. Uh, initial, uh, there is a feasibility study, as I understand it, whether it's a business case feasibility study, whatever the title is, that went to the two councils that contains uh, all of the case and a significant amount of commercial and confidence material. Uh, I haven't received that full document. However, there was a significant amount of material that was uh, part of what went to the uh, councils. Uh, that also included commercial and confidence material that was provided to the government in the context of preparing the questions about the funding package that was announced yesterday uh, and was able to be assessed on its merits. Uh, there, that uh, material, of course, because it still contains a high degree of commercial and confidence material, can't be released. The uh, two universities have released a transition plan, which can, again contains some of the elements of those documents and uh, as uh, the two vice chancellors have committed to producing uh, elements of what might be called a business case for why a merged institution or a new university formed of the other two would be of merit uh, in a way that doesn't compromise their competitive positioning. Uh, they, they've committed to producing that in the near future for public consumption. Um, now, I understand very clearly why there are questions about what government has seen, uh, what, what we've been able to digest and the ways in which we've been able to make decisions about what we'd like to do next. Um, they are legitimate questions. We have to uh, keep in mind that these institutions operate in a highly competitive market, in not only in Australia, although significantly in Australia, but also globally. They have mapped out a plan to grow substantially and they have a pathway to that growth. It is not in our, our collective interests for them to compromise uh, the, the way in which they plan to do that in a way that might facilitate competitors taking advantage of the transition time. It is, however, legitimate that the people of South Australia understand that uh, the government has been able to assess the merits of the argument that a larger institution would be of merit for, the for South Australia and also some of the detail that sits behind the rationale for each of the elements of the funding package. Uh, so although that's quite a, a long answer, I think it's necessary because it's very easy to distill uh, have you seen a thing called a business case? And if you haven't, then how can you make this decision? Um, but if you take each of those elements separately, uh, I'm satisfied that we've seen sufficient information that's uh, su sufficiently of weight and justified to justify proceeding with draft legislation for consideration by Parliament, and as I understand it, perhaps also an inquiry, and also to justify a package of, of support for the new university that uh, has a relatively small amount of money that is simply expenditure now and a significant amount that is about um, facilitating what we believe to be strategically important to the future of the state. Um, I take from that that the information that was provided, whether it's called a business case or a feasibility study, uh, for the sake of today, let's just call it a business case, uh, to the university councils, that contains information relevant to their decision that wasn't provided to government. Am I correct in taking that from your answer? Uh, well, Let me ask a different way. I, I appreciate the Minister says she hasn't been given the document that was given to the councils the other night. Has anyone in government been provided with that business case? Uh, the, that document, I don't know how much it overlaps with the material that we have because I haven't, by definition, seen it. Uh, it was a document that was provided to the councils because they have a fiduciary duty to make a decision about what is in the interests of their institution. 
and so uh, it's quite likely that it would have material that was shaped for the purpose of considering each individual university's future. Uh, and they may not have been the same document. There's, these are, and we, we should probably take a little bit of time to get into this question of what universities are, what kind of entity they are, because um, there is no analogy. Well, no, but there is no analogy. They're, they're, they're yeah. not uh, businesses and companies, nor are they de government departments. They are universities with a very complex governance structure, uh, which I think we probably should get into. But um, the, the material that has been provided to government and is in the process in part of being made public for scrutiny, I think is sufficient to justify the steps that we are taking. And <coughs> as I understand it, although I've been in estimates since nine o'clock this morning, um, there is some uh, discussion about ways in which a, an inquiry for Parliament can be established so that the Parliament is able to satisfy itself on that information before the next step is taken, which is the, own, the most significant step, which is whether or not we will create a new act. If we don't, there will be no new, new university. So there is still that time, that opportunity to consider the merits and to make sure that uh, members of parliament are equipped with the information that they require. Thank you. In relation to that range of information uh, from the universities to the department, the minister described as having informed the funding process. Uh, can the minister describe whether any analysis uh, was undertaken by her department or elsewhere within government to form what might be considered a business case or a feasibility study from the point of view of taxpayers and of the government? To put it more clearly, the business cases the universities provided to their councils were to work out whether they considered it in being the, in their interests to proceed. The government's job is to work out whether it's in the interests of South Australia to proceed. It's a different question. So is exactly. there a government feasibility study other than the Labor Party's election promise for a university commission uh, that informs uh, whether or not this is a good deal for South Australia? Uh, exactly, and I think you've made uh, the point I was uh, seeking mm -hmm. to make earlier, that the documents may be different in the sense that a slightly different question is being asked. Um, the information that we have uh, enables us to be confident that the modelling that the universities have discussed and was, um, d was released yesterday to the public uh, of the economic impact uh, of a new institution by the mid-2030s uh, is a, a reasonable expectation. And that modelling is, uh, tells us that Aust South Australia will benefit from this new institution substantially. Um, what information, you talked about a range of information that has been provided to government by the unis but not but they haven't provided the business case. What is the nature of the information that the, gov that the universities uh, have provided to government uh, over and above the 19 page transition plan that the universities released yesterday uh, and the other material that is in the public domain already? So Minister, can you to hold on for a second. Um, Sorry. M member for Moriarta, uh, I want to give you as much latitude as I can but I just remind members that they do have to have a financial aspect to the question. The, the sir, sir, let me finish. Let me, let me finish. Don't interrupt. I didn't interrupt you. Okay. First. Uh, interrupted the minister, sir. Sorry. The minister was answering. You interrupted her, sir. Well, I didn't interrupt you, though. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I just ask that your questions would at least try to have a financial component because if you want to ask just generous questions generally about the, the whole proposal, we have question time for that. And that's what question time is for. This is a specific opportunity to ask questions which are, have a budgetary implications. So the budget papers are detailed. There is a highlight that directly and specifically goes to this point, yep. that facilitated the government's commitment to evaluating yes. the feasibility, and we're talking about the investment of $440 million that's been identified as being within the budget. Yep. Uh, I think uh, the question is entirely within order, and I encourage uh, you to so, Sorry, the member for Moriarta, actually, I determine whether the question's in yes, order. Yes, so I asked you to allow it, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, I, would, I would suggest, could you rephrase it to make a little bit more financial, please? Um, in order to justify the $440 million expenditure the government has provided, uh, what analysis 
has been provided to that information and what is the nature of that information uh, that has been provided to the government by the universities. So you, you can do it when you try, Member for Moriarty. Uh, so I feel that I've um, substantially answered that question. Um, obviously, the $440 million doesn't sit in my budget line, uh, but uh, I'm nonetheless happy to answer on behalf of the government about the assessment of the merits of this, uh, of this uh, contemplation of a new university. Uh, but a as m more information is able to be made public, um, ensuring that we're not compromising the competitive circumstances for the two universities, uh, it will become clearer uh, what, what is sat behind the financial analysis that occurred uh, and also the, the modelling that uh, justifies the benefits for South Australia of a new institution. Oh. And it has to be said that the, the... Well, it doesn't have to be said. I would like to add that uh, it is... For people who understand how universities work in Australia, it is clear that larger universities are greater economic contributors. And the fact that we haven't had a large university in this state has been talked about for decades. So this isn't an idea that suddenly came out of nowhere six months ago nor yesterday. This is an idea that's been interrogated and interrogated. And in fact, uh, there was a process that was started under the, well, during the term of the previous government, although I'm not sure what involvement the previous government had in those contemplations. Uh, but the, the understanding that mass scale makes a difference, particularly in research, which provides the economic weight for the institution, and when we're talking about a high, a group of eight institution, and this new institution has already been invited to be part of the group of eight, then there's also the capability, the capacity for additional international students to, who will want to be part of a group of eight institution without going over the percentage that already is uh, the international student representation for the University of Adelaide. Uh, then it, it is clear that there are economic benefits. The structuring of the package that was announced yesterday is one that in many ways could be described as no regrets. So what is it doing? It's buying land, which is then an asset that is held by the government and can be used strategically, and particularly I think that's important with the McGill campus because the University of South Australia even without a merger, has been clear that it will be exiting that campus. Now, do we want that simply to be bought by whoever wants to put their hand up on the market? Or do we want it to be treated as a strategic ac asset by the state? Well, I'd rather the latter. And it becomes a, matter, a, a, a piece of land that has value on our books. Uh, again, if we look at the 30 million that's being put into international student attraction, uh, that at times, immediately before COVID indeed, international students are our biggest export in South Australia. I suspect we're the only state where that's true. They are immensely important to us and of huge economic benefit as well as the cultural interactions. So uh, the fact that we will be able to have more international students and that we're putting some money into attracting them, again, can only be a good thing. There's $12 million sitting in the actual budget lines that we're discussing this afternoon. Uh, Six million, sorry. The six million dollars um, that's being that's sitting in, in our uh, in our budget lines for uh, study Adelaide to attract more international students across the board. Uh, this is something that we should do as a government, and other states are doing, and we need to maintain our place. And then we're talking about two funds that sit on government books that are uh, going to be directed towards more research, aligning with our strategic priorities, and. A broader diversity of students going to university. And as a uh, former education minister, uh, you will well know that S South Australia is undereducated on average. We have fewer people with bachelor degrees, proportionally, than most of the other states. And unsurprising, given our history and our relative poverty levels, but unacceptable for a sustainable future. So how is there a regret in setting aside money to assist with that? So the way in which the funding's been structured on the basis of understanding the economic benefits for, uh, of a large institution, and particularly the way in which this one will be structured, and no regrets in, uh, effort for, for supporting that, uh, I think is completely justifiable. But if we're going to have an, an inquiry with uh, members of parliament sitting on it, you will be able to see far more detail, and it is in parliament's hands whether we proceed with this or not.
Thank you. Um, in relation to a couple of things that came directly from the Minister's answer, what is the government planning on doing with the land at McGill? And will the community childcare centre, sports field, swimming pool, and obviously the heritage building in particular be protected? So uh, a very legitimate question. Um, the plan in the short term is to do master planning for the land that's on the other side of the road, so not the main McGill campus, and that will be undertaken presumably by Renewal, who had input into the assessment of the merits of purchasing uh, the land. Uh, so they will undertake that process. And then uh, for, I, I believe, up to 10 years, the university will remain on the campus side and giving lots of time to consider what will happen in the future uh, so that we're able to think about this sort of strategically in two parcels. Um, work will, the, the assessment, the master planning will happen with the local community, there's no question, and heritage will be respected. The, um, in relation to other campuses held by the two universities other than McGill, mm. has uh, the government, has the minister received any advice as to whether any of those campuses will be closed or indeed um, uh, retained as a result of the merger? So, uh, of course, Mawson Lakes forms part of the agreement as well. So uh, there's a purchase of rights to use the uh, land that isn't campus used at the moment. There's no immediate plans to do anything else with that. Uh, the, there will be at some point in the future a master planning process that again would involve discussion with current users, but absolutely no plans to move forward with that at this stage. And the university is committed to remaining uh, with the university presence at, at Mawson Lakes, which I think is very important. And indeed the, uh, the, the uh, leadership of both universities have said that they wish to be more involved in the north of Adelaide as part of this effort to have a broader range of people studying at university. Uh, so there's been no indication to me that there'd be any retreat from any other campus. And given that the plan is for greater accessibility and for growth, uh, I would be surprised other than a logistical strategic repositioning that might occur sometime in the future that there would be no plan in the short term for altering campus composition. Um, thank you. Um, directly on the budget line, uh, whether it's the evaluation of the feasibility or indeed the Minister's own discussions, uh, is the Minister able to advise us what the impacts will be on regional South Australia, uh, whether existing campuses uh, are guaranteed to stay open, including service delivery, current places, and the emerging uh, number of uni hubs that have uh, started to become a feature? Uh, so I think I, I started <coughs> to get to that at the end of my uh, other answer, my last answer. So the universities have indicated no interest in exiting or, and no plans to exit any other campuses. Uh, they have also been very clear that they are wanting to create a new university that will grow and will grow in a way that attracts students currently not going to university. Now, some of those students are living in Adelaide and uh, are socially disadvantaged, may come from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, but many of the students will also be living regionally. Into the future, will that always be done through a physical campus in a physical town? Who, who knows what the future of education will look like? But the plan is that there will be more teaching, not less, and there is no specific plan to, re to, uh, to remove any campuses that I'm aware of other than exiting the McGill site in the next 10 years. Thank you. Um, again, same budget line and in relation, uh, the government has identified the $440 million in various aspects of investment. Uh, as part of the Minister's discussions to unlock that $440 million, how much have the universities committed from their resources towards the transition and implementation of the proposal? Uh, I will take that on notice because I'm uncertain about the extent of commercial confidentiality with that information. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Well, can I, uh, I'll, I'll ask the straight question, but I sort of take it from that. Am, am I correct to take it from that, that whether or not we're able to identify that figure, a figure has been arrived at and confirmed with the government from the universities? Uh, there, there are extensive costs associated with making a transition. So can the, given that the, if the universities are making a commitment of their own, can the minister rule out state government funds being used to pay for redundancies uh, of uh, anyone losing their jobs as a result of the merger. I appreciate there's been a commitment of no forced redundancies for people who have contracts up until I think the middle of 2027, uh, but beyond that. 
Uh, yeah, so for two reasons. One, I've described the support that we'll be giving and none of that uh, in any way is associated with giving the university money. Uh, the 30 million, sure, uh, we'll work out how we best spend that on the international student uh, recruitment and it may well be via the, universe, the new university, but uh, the, this is not about simply handing over cash and wondering how that, that will be spent. Um, the, the real answer, though, is one that was referred to, and that is that there's been a commitment to no forced redundancies. Uh, when the two vice-chancellors were asked about that in the press conference yesterday, as um, I've previously discussed with them as well, it's interesting to hear your own questions then asked by journalists, uh, the commitment to the four years is in order to uh, assure people that the transition will not be about making redundancies. The, the plan for the university beyond that is for growth. There's an anticipated uh, significant increase in staffing that will be required. Uh, but it is reasonable for the new institution not to have a mechanism under enterprise agreement that every other university has. So it's simply returning to normal, uh, but is not something that is in any way being contemplated as we will just save up positions <laughs> for the, for four years' time. That is a, a very clearly not the plan of the, of the councils nor of, of the vice-chancellors. Um, has the minister or the government secured a commitment from the universities to uh, transfer a particular number of casual staff to permanent contracts? And if not, has the government secured any commitment in relation to the ongoing employment and future of those casual staff, who I understand may be as much of a f as a fifth of the workforce? Uh, look, there's, there's no commitment uh, that exists that isn't publicly known. So we haven't got that as a commitment uh, from the universities. But I, um, you know, having grown up around universities and, and uh, worked at one, am horrified at the extent of casualisation across all Australian universities. It's uh, one of the implications of the way in which higher education has been treated in this country for some considerable time. Uh, it is one of the features that I raised with Professor Mary O'Kane, who's undertaking the accord process. Uh, that seems to me, for professional staff as well, but I would say particularly for research and teaching academic staff, to be casualised in the early years of your academic career uh, must be a huge disincentive to speaking up, to contributing and to uh, thinking that this is your career and not be attracted elsewhere into industry. Um, so uh, I am open for discussions about ways in which all of our universities can do better on that. I would hope that a stronger, wealthier um, group of eight institution would be more capable of employing people on a better, uh, on, under better conditions. Um, I'll add an extra budget line to assist us, although the, the other one still applies, but on the previous page, 163, uh, there is a line that talks about industry innovation and science has a cost of services. Um, part of that, I think, includes the unit within the Minister's Department that focuses on higher education policy from memory in the order of a million dollars uh, or thereabouts in its budget from last year's estimates. Um, does that unit or has the Minister's Department more broadly uh, received advice from the university or other sources about how many of their staff are casuals? Uh, and indeed, uh, whether there is a vulnerability for those staff uh, losing their jobs in this process, uh, given that I assume they don't, they're not relevant for the no forced redundancy policy? Uh, so I'll take on notice whether we've been supplied with that information rather than starting to swap advisors around. Um, but I would be surprised if either of the institutions are significantly different from the average Australian experience. There's no reason particularly why they would be. Um, I, I come back again to this, this um, creation of a new university from two existing ones hasn't come out of the ether as a, 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 on a whim. It is a response to the way in which higher education exists uh, and is funded uh, and is guided in policy terms uh, in this country. Uh, one feature of which is that our research input is significantly dependent on international student income, which I don't believe any other advanced country chooses to do. And also uh, that the, the way in which funding works has encouraged um, the use, the heavy use of, of um, casualised workers, particularly uh, for teaching. 
Um, the, the most recent round of reform under the previous Commonwealth Government was a disgrace. It punished students for their choices by fiddling around with what the hex fee was so that there was a disincentive to study things uh, like, like um, uh, social sciences and humanities. And yet at the same time, also punished universities by requiring an additional, I think it was 100,000 students to be taught with no additional money. So while a student was being encouraged to study a STEM topic by dropping the hex, the federal government didn't replace the funding that they were losing from the student paying less, so that it became a disincentive to teach a STEM course. Just a completely absurd situation and just one example of why this is a rational response to try to get greater mass to do better teaching and better research, that can only be better for the employment circumstances of the people there. And I think that federal governments should take some responsibility for the way in which they've treated higher education, for why universities are forced to go through what will be a very complex and time-consuming process. As I say, this didn't come out of the ether. It's a rational response to the circumstances in which we find ourselves. I think the Minister's response, if I can ask just one direct follow-up, the Minister's response talks about the ideal of where the university is proposed to get to. Um, I guess my question is specifically in relation to the transition time uh, where staff are at the moment concerned about losing the jobs that they have now rather than what jobs might be available in eight years' time. I, I appreciate the Minister took some aspect of that question on notice and is, can I just clarify, are you able to provide a response to that fear, that concern that exists now, or do you want to just provide that in your question on notice? Well, the, the, it is true that when you're a casualised worker you don't have the same protections and no forced redundancies in general wouldn't apply to you. Uh, so whether um, there's any different view that's been taken by the universities, I will take that on notice. But if you pair it with the existing commitment that, uh, was, that predates this one, which is that there would be no net job loss, then what you're talking about is not shedding staff. And so that ought to give great comfort also to those who are not on secure contracts. Thank you. Thank you for your forbearance, Chair. Um, I'm, I'll go back to the same, the same budget line and in relation to either the work that the unit has done with the universities uh, or which the Minister has done through her engagements, uh, do we have an understanding of what departments and courses are proposed to be merged or discontinued under the plan and what new departments or courses are proposed to be established? So I think there we're starting to get to the heart of um, at least part of the concerns about the universities not having too much of their growth plan released in public because they can see where they're going to position themselves against their competitors. Uh, that said, the transition plan does countenance extensive discussions now with the university communities about the ways in which teaching will, will change. Uh, for example, they are, I understand, going to move to a trimester model in order to facilitate getting through your degree more quickly, just as an example. Um, the, the way in which they will ad adapt to a new curriculum, which is also a commitment that they're going to be providing a new curriculum, uh, I think will become clear as we go through this transition plan and people will have plenty of time and opportunity to speak to it. Uh, I don't think that it is... State governments and state parliaments have an enormous stake in universities doing well, both at the research and commercialisation level and at the teaching level. They don't ultimately control many of the levers that are associated with, with what students will choose to do, which is often associated with HEX and uh, with the capping of places and so on, which is all held by the Commonwealth, which is part of why unis are so complex uh, in their governance arrangements. Um, but I think we ought to participate in discussing that but not see that that is something that's directly within our control. Thank you. Um, has the unit uh, provided any advice or had any discussions with Flinders University, uh, in particular whether, given the stated aims of the two funds for research and low SES, are both things that are of interest to Flinders University as well, uh, whether there is an avenue for funds to be applied to Flinders' benefit as well as the new university as a result of the establishment of these funds, which the Minister has described as no regrets? Uh, yes, um, and... I hesitate to add this because, um, you know, you love all your children, 
the same, and you don't you don't play favourites. But I am a creature of Flinders University. I'm Australian because Flinders existed, and my parents came here to Stafford, and I studied there and uh, worked there briefly. It's um, an institution that's very dear to my heart. I'm sure they uh, have high hopes. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think my my greater point is that um, we are responsible for the sector, not for an individual university. And the announcement yesterday was entirely about what is occurring to facilitate the creation of a new university that we believe will be transformational for the state. Uh, our commitment to having a healthy sector remains and uh, I've had discussions with Flinders, um, the units had discussions with Flinders uh, in the lead up to the announcement and then the Premier has had, a, had conversations uh, in the, um, on this side of the announcement with the Vice-Chancellor to assure him that we will remain in discussions about ensuring that Flinders remains competitive and strong. Thank you. Um, has the government convinced drafting legislation for the merger, and if so, has it shared uh, drafts with the universities at this stage? Uh, there has been discussion back and forth between the universities and us on what draft legislation would look like. Um, I'm not sure if we discussed it back when the Statement of Cooperation was signed at the end of last year, uh, but there was a view that the, uh, from even then that the base of the new Act ought to be the University of South Australian Act, Australia's Act because that is the most modern, uh, being only 32 years old, and also that it is um, more explicitly responsive to equity. So uh, we have taken that as the base and had, have had discussions with the universities. That said, um, we, the, the legislation ultimately, as we've said, is, is the creature of Parliament, um, but will be going to public consultation as well as stakeholder cons consultation. So the version that, that um, is in sort of proto protean form right now will, will evolve during that period. Uh, and then I'm not certain where we're landing the idea of, of a committee to, to inquire into it, um, but presumably will be the subject of that committee as well, and then will be um, subject to the, the decisions made by us in here. Can, I was going to ask just simple when the, will the legislation be introduced to the parliament but perhaps the minister can identify uh, what the other aspects of the time frame are as well. So uh, um, we'll go out to consultation fairly quickly because we've got a, a draft basis and uh, we, I would like to bring it in as, as soon as we get back um, to, into parliament after the, the break. Um, what I don't know, and there may have been discussions indeed across the chamber um, while I've been in this endless cycle of estimates, did I mention since nine o'clock this morning, um, that, that whether there have been some, some multi-party discussions about ways in which we might manage this. So at what, what time that ought to happen and, and at what point. But it will be publicly available very soon for members of parliament to have a look at because we're going to do public consultation. Um. Sir, I've got one, well, maybe just one more question on this line, and I don't want to be, I know you're concerned about being conversational, but it might make things quicker if I can just explain the question with context in the lead-up. Go ahead. My understanding, uh, Minister, is that there's one sitting day left until the winter break in the Legislative Council, that it's parties in the Legislative Council, uh, including the opposition, and as of this morning, uh, I think with the Premier's uh, endorsement that are likely to uh, have an inquiry established. So presumably if notice is given this Thursday, the first day available for that inquiry to be formalised is the first Wednesday when we're back. Uh, will the Minister give a commitment that the legislation will be, or at least the draft legislation, can be publicly released uh, prior to that resumption of the parliamentary sittings? We will be consulting during the break uh, with the public, so you will see the legislation very quickly it will be out in August for public consultation. So um, it, the, you're, you're right about the question of timing for, the, uh, for a committee, and as I say, I haven't been part of any discussions, but I'm sure that the timing will be worked out. Uh, well, I would just say on the committee, the, it's legitimate that people need to understand the case for this, and then also to, to say, what, what would you want to see in the Act? Um, what would be of concern to me is if we allow this to go on for too long because the countervailing challenge for the two universities that exist right now that are likely to form the new one is that they need to be able to continue to enrol students to advertise and to get staff. 
So we need to, to minimise uncertainty while still allowing proper inquiry. And thank you. This will be my last question on this run. The 19-page transition plan that the universities and the government released, or I think the universities released at the government's press conference yesterday, that looks like it, uh, it contains on about the fourth or the fifth page a chart uh, where it talks about what's going to happen in different stages. And it talks about the legislative expectations, the parliament to pass legislation in quarter one, 2024. Uh, my assessment, therefore, is that the uh, legislation to their end needs to be passed by March 2024, enable for them to get TEXA uh, accreditation, uh, in, advertise for international students and everything else. Yeah. And it, I just invite the Minister to ensure that the Parliamentary Committee is able to fulfil its responsibility to report in a timely fashion, allowing time for the parliamentary debate after that. Uh, is the Minister committing that her department and the government will uh, cooperate fully with that inquiry? Uh, well, First of all, it's difficult for me to commit in great detail, having not been part of any discussions that I'm sure have been occurring today. Um, but of, of course, if there's a parliamentary inquiry, we will participate in and provide the information that's required. There's no question that we would um, obey the, the conventions. Um, just on this date, um, I had hoped, ideally, that we could get it through before the end of the year. Now, that is very ambitious, because I always worry about letting things slip into the very drop-dead time for, in this case, for the accreditation of the new university, as you point out. Um, so I, I still will want to do everything I can to make this as speedy as possible without running over um, legitimate process. But you're right to acknowledge that the universities themselves have identified that. I just think that they don't deal with Parliament all that often. So they're probably a bit more optimistic about our nature.